Good evening, everybody. It is Atwood Unleashed 131, co-hosted by Stephen Knights. And we've got a hell of a lineup for you. There's been more breaking royal news. I'm looking at an article that just came out two hours ago. King Charles is seen leaving Clarence House amid cancer battle after Palace aide said there's zero chance. Prince Harry can return as a working royal despite Olive Branch. We will be looking at that much more closely with my first guest. You may have seen us on George the Giant Slayer's channel recently, and it's YouTuber Baggage Claim. First time on the channel, it's a great pleasure. And Baggage Claim's channel aims to break down the culture wars by focusing on narcissistic celebrities like Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, Jada Pinkett Smith, Amber Heard, and rabid ideological capture. And then over to Stephen at seven. Yeah, from seven o'clock till half seven, I'll be speaking to filmmaker and philosopher Travis Brown. Uh, he makes films challenging dominant narratives. I've interviewed Travis before. He's a great guest. Uh, he's currently uh, putting out the YouTube series Uncomfortable Truths, the Reality of Gender Identity Ideology. Uh, so that's his latest docu-series on the problems of gender identity ide ideology. Uh, the series should help people better understand the trans movement and what can be done to help protect kids, families, and everyone else negatively negatively affected by this ideology. Looking forward to that. And following up from that, from 7.30, I'll be speaking to writer, academic, and mixed martial arts, arts artist, rather, Dr. Carlton Brick. He'll join us to discuss his book, Contesting County Lines, Case Studies in Drug Crime and Deviant entrepreneurship uh combining a compulsive read with rigorous academic analysis the book tells real life stories of drug dealers involved in county lines networks including their methods motives and misfortunes uh, the conventional wisdom surrounding county lines often portrays drug runners as exploited victims and gang proliferation as a market driven exercise it suggests a business model facilitated exclusively by smartphone technology and routinely regulated by violence but this isn't always the case and dr brick will explain why looking forward to that and i believe we switch over to locals and it's and me again got... yep yeah so between eight and nine i'll be speaking to associate professor in middle eastern and global history at nottingham trent university uh nicholas morton he released his most recent book mongol storm in late 2023 uh, the book offers a history of the Mongol invasions into the Middle East told from many different perspectives. Um, uh, uh, Byzantine, Mamluk, Ayyubid and Crusader. Uh, there we go. And our final guest of the evening on Locals is Michael Leflem, who is the best-selling author of Visions of Atlantis. Love a bit of Atlantis. Reclaiming our lost ancient legacy he is also an adjunct professor of philosophy and history a scuba diver and a columnist for new dawn magazine and publishers weekly so we've got a four-hour lineup coming up and we're gonna get straight into the royal coverage with baggage claim when she joins us momentarily. In fact, here she is. So we will see you, Stephen, in an hour or so. Catch you in an hour. Have a good chat. Cheers, my friend. All right. Before I bring Manisha in from baggage claim, I'll just give you the headline that's come out. And it is King Charles has been pictured leaving Clarence House. This was just a few hours ago as he continues his treatment for cancer, after palace aides are saying there is zero chance, zilch, nada chance, of Prince Harry returning as a working royal. 75-year-old Charles has been staying at his Sandringham estate in Norfolk since the cancer diagnosis was announced, but he was back in London today. 
He has postponed all public duties while undergoing treatment for the unspecified cancer, which was found by doctors while he was being treated for his benign enlarged prostate. After his diagnosis was revealed on February 6th, Harry made that transatlantic dash from California to be there, but they only were together for 30 minutes or so at Clarence House before Charles returned to Sandringham, which caused speculation to be running rife, especially after the Times claimed the Duke of Sussex was willing to return to a temporary royal role to support his father during the illness. But claims that Prince Harry could return to the royal fold were dismissed. Sources say His Majesty is firmly of the opinion there is no way back for the Duke of Sussex as a working royal in any way, shape, or form. Insiders are stressing this does not mean Charles isn't open to repairing his relationship with his son in the future. But this is very different from Harry being invited to support the king professionally uh, during his cancer battle. All right, let us bring baggage claim in now then. Hey, how's it Hello. going? Good, good. How are you? Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. And before we begin, could you just tell the viewers a little bit about what you do? Sure, sure. So uh, my name is, you know, I'm, I, I'm, as you said, my name is Manisha. I don't generally introduce myself that way, but I think more and more people know me as that now. But I run the channel Baggage Claim where I make video essays about things that are impacting us culturally. Uh, specifically about the Western culture, like anything impacting America and and the West in general, including the UK. And for a long time, I was making content about um, Meghan Markle because I feel like she's kind of reflects the rise of narcissism in our culture, which is which has been, I think, is very cancerous. And I think that's something we should address head on. Absolutely, and we'll get to that in way more detail soon. So baggage claims links are in the description box below this video. Please go over and support and follow. I'll do a poll before we start the questions. If you have got any questions, particularly pertaining to the Royals, put them in the chat wherever you are watching this in the world, and we will put them to baggage claim. And the poll is, would you like to see Prince Harry back as a working Royal? If you would, put a one in the chat. If you would not put a two in the chat. <laughs> Baggage claim, would you like to see Prince Harry back as a working royal? I would not. And I I find it's I find it astounding that he thinks that he even can try. Uh, and I don't think he thinks that he can actually successfully get back uh, to the to the to the royal family. I think the reason he's throwing something like this at a time of such crisis is really just to increase his publicity. But he is, he and Meghan have both betrayed the family so intensely, a family that really values its privacy, that, um, that it's surprising that he thinks that he could even get back into any sort of room where they would be, be talking about anything, um, anything uh, private, important, necessary. I mean, I think they're going to keep him at arm's length. But this is also a great ploy for him to say, look, I'm I'm trying to make inroads with my family at a time that they need me. And, um, and here they are denying me, which is a very narcissistic tool to leverage to say, well, I'm I'm trying I'm making my I'm taking uh, I'm making my effort and playing my part in the role. But what about all the betrayals that you've you've um, committed publicly in, in your book, in the, in the documentary, there's no recognition of that. And that's typically what a narcissist will do. They will, they will sell this narrative that they're the righteous ones, they're the virtuous ones doing right by their, their roles uh, for the sake of their families or their relationships. And then, um, and then the reality is actually completely different, which is that you're actually stabbing me with one hand and pretending to wipe my tears with another, <laughs> right? So. And Prince William is also understood to share the, the same opinion that he shouldn't be brought in as a working royal. Kensington Palace has made it clear that his focus is on returning to work after taking a break 
to care for his wife following her operation last month. And Harry has been encouraged by warm exchanges between himself and the king since his father's diagnosis was revealed earlier this month, the Times has suggested. William has told friends he would be happy <clears throat> to step into a royal role while his father is unwell. So is that the narcissist just trying to parlay his father's diagnosis into an opportunity for himself? Yes, absolutely. It's it's faux it, it, it's faux love, right? I, I could probably come up with a better word than that, but he shows up, he makes this emergency flight to his father. And then um, the next day he's at a Las Vegas event, makes no mention of his father's illness. And he's, he's really is, I, I, George the Giant Slayer said it perfectly a couple of weeks ago on the stream that you and I were on, where he said he's just recharging his royal credit card. And it did sort of feel like that. It was such a flyby, um, flyby meeting. Granted, he didn't have probably say in how long he got to spend with the king. But it seemed like it was less about the king and more about he wanted to look a certain way, like the doting son, like the son who's willing to set everything aside versus actually showing up. Please get your questions in the chat if they relate to Harry and Morgan, Meghan in particular. And the first one is from Ray J. Isn't the royal family proof of hereditary narcissism? <clears throat> that's an that's an interesting way to look at it. I I think um, I think that whole idea that uh, that you have the right to rule because you were born into a certain family has become such an old fashioned idea, and uh, that was just so rampant for for centuries, uh, not centuries for millennia, and now we've we've uh, evolved into um, a right to rule. You have to earn the right to rule based on on the say of the people. And, um, but what the, what the royal family has really evolved into, they ha I mean, they have no rights to rule. They have, they have no say on policy uh, at all. What they are is a representation of a culture and they have an, they're, they're an, an embodiment of that culture and they have a lifelong duty to play the roles representing that culture. And if you look at um, the evolution of America versus the United Kingdom, where we have no such symbol we, in, in living beings, right? We, we have no concept of what it means to be an American embodied in, in any sort of family that represents that back to us. So we've lost our way in a lot of ways. Instead, we loft up either celebrities or politicians. So I think you could call it narcissism or you could say that it's 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 a duty that they have to inherit um, uh, over time and be trained in from birth and they have to play certain roles otherwise they lose their place in in that society it you know it, the royal family is hanging on by a thread in a lot of ways if they don't if they don't fulfill the contract and what they owe the people they will be they will be out very quickly because it is such an old fashioned idea, but I think it ha it's invaluable. Um, anytime someone messes up, like like Prince Andrew, you, you know, there's a deep outcry because this is a contract that they have to uphold. They have to be proper symbols for the country. Otherwise, it, there's no value to them. So following on for that, then, do you think that is an old fashioned value that needs to be sustained or is it an anachronism now? I think it's more valuable today than ever uh, because of the the world we live in where we reject every any sort of of custom because it's considered old fashioned. We, we have lost a lot of connections to the past, but the reason certain uh, certain customs if, endeavor over over time is because they offer some value even um even s small things if you look at religious customs we often look at it as the what is what is the value of doing something like that what's the value of of um of naming ceremonies in various cultures or or coming together at certain times at the dinner table or giving each other presents at certain times there's there's a value in all of that it's that 
we, we only look at the custom without actually thinking about the value. And so there's been this separation in a lot of ways where Christmas, let's say, has become just about giving presents when really it's about it's about coming together. A lot of it is about coming together and, and setting aside differences. Um, and, and the royal family maintains a lot of the customs from a governmental perspective for the United Kingdom. For example, the king has to stay above the fray, whereas politicians can be swayed by money, by power. But the king has the king has no um, no ability to earn from his position. He has no ability to dictate anything. So he has to be above all of that, above politics, above all of that. What does he really represent? He represents the will of the people, and and in that way, there's a level, there's a hope that the king or the queen or the sovereign always stays apart from the turning tides of, of money, of influence, of all of those things, and instead keeps that steady hand of what is the purpose of governance. It's about people, it's about duty. And I think the fact that the politicians have to answer to that is so important. We don't have that in America. The, the president doesn't have to answer to anybody except for the people, but there's so much information now hidden from the people. There's so many things happening in back channels. We don't, the people in America almost have lost that ability to govern ourselves. If you look at, I, I don't want to get too political, so I'll just end it after this, but if you look at what's happening even with the Democratic, uh, the Democratic Party in America is that it's so clear that the president is not, um, doesn't have his full faculties and yet the wool is constantly being pulled yeah. over the American people that he's fine he's fine and what's going to happen last minute they're going to sweep in with their own uh, own plant of a candidate instead of actually giving the people the opportunity to vote for someone right that I mean that that's the sort of manipulation that's happening in a in a republic that should not be tolerated. And so you need some figurehead to intervene in those instances. And, and so I, I think I think America is languishing without a monarch, which is not something I thought I would ever say, honestly. That is a fascinating perspective. It's made a few things click in my head. So let me just try and go over this. So are you saying then that an increasingly atomized societies that we've got today and the mental ailments that come with them when you've got something that people can rally to it is an antidote to that whereas in america you've not got that but what you have got is someone to rally to who's non compus mentis which probably exacerbates the mental ailments of an atomized society yes <laughs> <laughs> yes, who would have, who would have thought, right? And you know, there was so much pride that I always felt that oh, America, America, you know, pushed off a, a monarchic society and 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 found its freedom in in a new novel way of of um, of ruling. But the only reason that that has been successful for such a long time was because of the culture. The culture was oriented towards honesty uh, around answering to a higher power that wasn't money um, and for a long time that's why the American system continued to persevere in a way that felt like things worked and I think that was the case until as, as recently as the 90s but I, I have more thoughts on this but I, I feel like the the disintegration of our society has really happened because people have lost any concept of what's a higher power for me to answer to and I think if Human beings don't have a higher power in our mind. Let's say, even if it's a, it's God, say I owe to be, you know, when no one's looking, I owe myself and I owe a higher power to be to try to be the best person possible um, and try to do right by the people around me and the duties that, 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 that entail. But if you kill God, what becomes the highest power? It becomes us. And if it becomes us in our mind, that's a very narcissistic perspective. What usually takes over quickly are things like money, gluttony, power, because it's all self-serving. Those concepts are all self-serving. And I think what's happened in America is that money has taken over as the new God or celebrities or power, like I said. And so people are no longer doing right by their duties, whether it's in a position as a CEO, 
as a president. Like if you would think about it, if if Biden or the people around Biden felt like they were answering to a higher power than themselves, they would say, this is wrong. Biden is an old man and he should be resting somewhere instead of pretending to run this country. This is morally wrong. We are, we are fooling people. But if all they care about power is like, no, we'll do whatever it takes. We'll, we'll fool whoever and whatever in order to make this run, right? So who, what power are they serving? And I think that's the real disintegration of society is if, if people feel like they don't have to answer to anybody. They, do, they can just do whatever they want. And that's, that's sort of what's happened. Yeah. We're talking about Harry, Meghan, narcissism. And not uh, politics. <laughs> I'll stop now about that. <laughs> with baggage claim, get your questions in. We're live for the next 50 minutes or so. And the first question is from Deanne Norris. Do you think that Mike and Zara Tyndall would better represent Invictus? Oh, far better. I mean, Mike is just such a great personality. He's a great uh, athlete himself. Uh, he's so fun loving. He's just, he's just a riot. The way Harry used to be. Harry used to be so much fun. And now he's just this ball of anger and resentment all the time. And uh, I think Zara and Mike would, would set aside their personalities too. Like they would add to it, but they would not make it about themselves. I think anytime Prince Harry and Meghan are involved in anything, it's like a little fashion show for them, you know, let us display our love. It's about us. And, and the interviews are all about us and not the athletes. And uh, I think it's, um, it's, they're always kind of standing on people, aren't they? They're always standing on top of using other people for their own, own gain. So who's got the most toxic narcissistic traits, Harry or Meghan? I would say, I would say Meghan has the more toxic traits, but Harry is, is toxic in the way that he can be used as a tool against his family. Um, Meghan, Meghan is so, um, is so manipulative um, in any way possible. I think go going back a little further to the me you can't see, the fact that Megan, you know, Harry re revealed that Megan threatened to, you know, unalive herself um, because of how, how much misery she was in and she wakes him up in the middle of the night sobbing and all of that. Um, that is, that's a very toxic thing to do to someone in a, in a relationship. And I say this as a woman where sometimes I'm in a fight with my husband and I'm not happy that I'm losing the fight and I can feel the need to start crying because I know if I start crying, he'll be like, oh no, it's okay. And I'm like, don't do it. Don't use that. It's like an easy way for me to not lose a fight. I think everybody has that ability to be toxic in a relationship. I, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm more able to do that. I don't know. Um, but to actually do that, like I look at my husband sometimes and I'm like, hey, I could, if I wanted as a woman, I could win every single fight. But then what would happen? I would lose the battle, which is that I would make him so miserable in the process. Um, I would lose the war, sorry. I mean, that I would make him so miserable in the process, convince him I'm right every single time, manipulate him to doing whatever I want, and what would happen, you know, he would just be absolutely miserable. And I think that's what's happened to Harry is that he has been so manipulated into just this ball of fury and resentment that he has broken every single one of his relationships. He's broken every single one of his um, friendships. He has nothing. He actually has nothing. And um, and I think um, I think that it takes a lot to destroy a person like that. I'm not saying he doesn't have a part to play in that. He absolutely does. He has responsibility absolutely in that because he's letting it happen. He's allowing it to happen because she's feeding his narcissism. He wants to lord it over his brother. He wants to believe that he's the better person over his brother, that his marriage is better than his brother's marriage. I mean, you have to be a pretty rotten person to want that kind of um, validation, to want to lean into that kind of thinking. Uh, so she she knew the game to play, 
but he allowed it to happen. He allowed her to get in and, you know, get in his head like that. So we've got a bit of a tongue in cheek question from Billy the Kid. Should royals be banned from marrying Americans? <laughs> 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 I love that question. You know, maybe. I don't know. We've not had the best batting average on that front. <laughs> oh, man. Um, that's a good question. Good question and good name, Billy the Kid. Uh, I think maybe. Maybe we should think about it. <laughs> All right. A Nexus has asked. How does a predominantly selfie narcissistic culture get turned around? Is it, is it incurable? You know what I found funny is uh, Instagram is all about, you know, selfie culture. But if you try to post a selfie on Twitter, it's actually kind of stupid. You don't see people post a lot of selfies on Twitter, which is smart. I think you would get a little roasted there. And then Instagram was the most deleted app of 2023. And so, so I think maybe, and Twitter, as much as, by the way, headlines will try to convince people otherwise, Twitter is, is doing really well. Yes, they're struggling with advertising because a lot of companies are trying to grandstand and, and pretend like they don't, um, or more like control Elon Musk and his, and his, um, his policies around free speech. But Twitter is doing really, really well. And um, I take that as a good sign that maybe selfie culture might be starting to die out. But there is still, um, if amongst the young people, there is an addiction to wanting attention, wanting to put yourself out there, whether it's through TikToks, through, um, through photos, through even terrible things like OnlyFans. Um, I think the only way to undo that is to encourage people to build more value than just relying on your looks. That, you know, try to build a good life for yourself. Be oriented towards people around you. Help your society, right? Um, whether it's volunteering or trying to, trying to even just build better inroads with your family, with your elders. I think we need more emphasis on the concept of family because it's the simple thing. Is like, and I'm sure you feel this way all the time, especially with your beautiful boy that when you're spending time with your your son you don't, you don't care about your phone you don't care about you know who's interacting with what post you made and I, I feel the same way you know I I live a pretty separated life from my family in a lot of ways because all week it's my husband and me we're just both working and and so I'm checking my phone all the time but the second I'm with family with my nieces with my brother my sister-in-law whoever I don't care about that. That's the thing is that we only care about what other people think of us when we don't have something more valuable. So I think that's that's the place to push people. I think it was Adam Smith who wrote in The Wealth of Nations about how societies and empires rise and fall. And he said that the hungry nations are warlike and the fat um greedy conquerors of other nations who've got you know just decadent and effeminized and they're getting eyeballed by the warrior nations who then conquer them but then the warrior nation they become greedy and out of shape and decadent and effeminized and the next warrior nation comes along and conquers them. And it seems that that cycle has gone for, on throughout history. But yeah. perhaps because we're in the age of mutually assured destruction right now, uh, technology has caused it to kind of freeze. I mean, if you look at America, the most powerful country in the world, you've got like people in the military trying to enter the military right now so out of shape they can't get the amount of people required for the military. So what I'm getting at here is that narcissism is usually, it's not, the whole thing is usually reset by war. Mm, yes, yes. Uh, I, I love that you quoted Wealth of Nations. I love that. I haven't read it in years, but that's a great quote. And 
Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this book called The Fourth Turning. Have you ever heard of that? No, what's that one? I think you'll find it really interesting. It was written in the 90s, and it, the, I forget the author's name, but he talks about how every 100 years there's sort of a, re, a fourth turning as, as a reset. He, he compares epochs as, as like 25 year periods where it goes through all the four seasons and during the fourth turning, it resets society in the form of a war. So he talked about how a hundred years before World War II, we had, we had uh, the civil war in America and a hundred years prior to that was the revolutionary war. And he talks about how society evolved in those periods. And we're kind of overdue for a war because what ends up happening is that there's this decadence, like you said, because you have too much peace and prosperity and it it creates these weaker people. But when the war comes, it actually resets everybody because it resets their priorities. And I have, but the thing is, I, I have I have this belief that maybe COVID was our war um, rather than an actual real war. Because if you look at the numbers of people that got killed without a single bullet being fired, I mean, it was a lot of people. And, uh, but it, it didn't have that impact. It didn't have that effect of bringing us together. In fact, we became even more divided as a result. And I think we're in times that are unanticipated, which is unpre unprecedented because, and I, I like someone said that, I wish we were living in precedented times because every day mm -hmm. feels so unprecedented. But I think it's because it's merging of so many cultures because of globalization that we don't know what values to really unite under. And I, and I think the only, you know, the only way before was to unite saying there's an external threat, right? But when we had the external threat of COVID, people couldn't even come together on that front. Right. So I, it's, it's a very it's a I don't know where we go from here. I think even the fourth turning, which is such a great book and was predicting kind of that we would come together, doesn't know where where we might be headed from here. That's absolutely fascinating, because after reading Spengler and Toynbee, I was convinced there is a hundred year war, world war cycle going back to like what you said, you know, uh, Napoleon even and Spain. Yes. And, and that did indeed reset society. But now we're in this mutually assured destruction era. Will that cycle unfold in this century remains to be seen because in that book, Guns, Germs and Steel, they said that the military technology advances and so does the casualties. But does it get to the point where the technology has advanced so much that it's just worldwide oblivion during the next, um, if the 100 year cycle continues will it be just oblivion on the next round yeah that's i'll, I'll check other, that book out I've, I've never read that that's very interesting and the other thing was you always see the rise of nationalism before the world war kicks off and nationalistic leaders getting elected right. and it does there are a lot of parallels um in some of the countries of the world with that right now all right anyway we're going yes. off on a massive tangent yes. here let's, let's, get back <laughs> Harry Harry and Meghan. And Meghan. let's go yes <laughs> so Astit is asking baggage claim and if you've got any questions put them in the chat please do you think harry has started to resent megan yes i think so i think I think the reason I can tell is because of how his demeanor shifts every time she, she's around versus when she's not. And uh, when it, even at the Invictus Games, not this this prom promotion that they did for the next Invictus Games, but the actual Invictus Games in Germany uh, earlier this year, earlier last year, uh, they Harry was just so happy when Meghan was not around. He was so carefree, and then the second she got there, his demeanor shifted so much. I think. He is resentful of her, but the reason he can't act on it is because he, I don't think he knows how to grapple with the fact that he has sacrificed everything for this one woman. And that if he had to acknowledge that, he would realize what a complete terrible decision that was because he's, it's one thing if you deviate away from your family for a little bit, but the insurmountable amount of damage he has done to every single one of his relationships in the forms of various betrayals, including hurting his grandparents who are now passed on their deathbeds. I don't think he can ever really properly atone for something like that. And so 
people often double down on, on their terrible beliefs, even after they start to realize that they might be wrong, because it feels easier to do that than to actually acknowledge that they're wrong. And so I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how you can ever kind of crawl back. It would take a lot of humility to recognize that and say, I was really, really, really wrong. I don't question think he has that humility. Question from Ray J. Can a marriage last with two narcissists? No, I don't think so. I think uh, you have to also look at it from the class of types of narcissists. I think like, let's look at the example of Harry and Meghan. Meghan is a narcissist as a lot of people have identified. And I think she has raised within him his narcissism because we all have some amount of narcissism. Uh, and I think she has stroked that part of him that he is very narcissistic. But he's not a narcissist himself because a narcissist needs all that attention, needs all that care, all that consideration. And um, while he can tap into that side of him from time to time, in general, he most of the time he's actually serving her narcissism. So that's not possible in, in a narcissist doesn't want to have a relationship of give and take. If they did, they would be a regular person. A true narcissist wants everything about them. They want to set the rules. They want, they don't want to respect anybody else's boundaries. So two narcissists are not going to uh, be able to even be in the same room as each other. Narcissists, true blown NPDs, stay as far away from each other as possible. They instead look out into the room and try to find the most people pleaser type personality. And then they zero in on that person because that person is going to do anything for their love. They're going to, you know, let go of any boundary. They're going to let go of any relationship to serve that person. That's what they're looking for. So Ray J, I'll refer you to a podcast we did with Richard Grannon, narcissist expert. And he ran down all the different types of narcissists, malignant, covert, etc. And what he said was, in the beginning, a relationship with two narcissists may work if they are complementary narcissists fulfilling each other's supplies. But in the long run, the uh, dark traits of these people tend to melt things down and they move on to the next victim. All right, so Billy the Kid... <laughs> is Megan really bad at reading the public? Is she kind of in an American liberal Hollywood type bubble? <laughs> I think she's in her own bubble. Uh, and the, even the Hollywood, pub, uh, Hollywood bubble is rejecting that. Uh, I think she's so... Um, She's so out for herself and uh, out to do whatever it takes to get what she wants that um, most people have seen through that in Hollywood. Her reputation sort of precedes her. People want nothing to do with her. I think um, there are, I'm sure there are a lot of narcissists in, in Hollywood, but I think over time their, their reputation gets so eroded that people kind of stay away from them because who wants to be around someone who wants to make everything about themselves, right? Uh, I think most celebrities have a healthy amount of narcissism and not an overpowering sense and can still find a way to work with each other. Megan's not that. And um, her perception, my guess, is that she thinks she's the best thing. She's better than even sliced bread, you know, in her mind. She's, you know, she, she needs to be queen of the world type of perspective. And um, she can't understand why people don't play to that and she looks down on everybody around them and she's resentful of everybody around them and is just sort of looking at everybody as a peasant that needs to bow down and people are just not playing playing her ball and her ball game anymore we are halfway through our live with baggage claim 30 minutes left before the next guest comes into the show so wherever you are watching this as well please put your questions in the comments in the chat Kukla has got a question. Did the royal family with the PR machine cover up just how rotten Harry really was? I think, I think the PR machine of the royal family helped Harry in a lot of ways, sort of, um, sort of curtail some of his rougher edges. But I think Harry was also a very different person from much of his life because of how much he was willing to listen to the people around him. This is one, one thing that's very interesting is that when you get into a relationship with a narcissist, 
your personality sort of changes, like the worst parts of you come out and um, you become a much worse person. Uh, the, you know, in any given point, we have the opportunity to be a better version of ourselves or worse version of ourselves. And every day it's a choice, right? Any opportunity um, of any situation is an opportunity to prove are you a good person? Are you a bad person? Are you going to behave well? Are you going to behave poorly? I think Harry, because he was surrounded by family, he was surrounded by friends that were constantly challenging him and whatever he was doing, he was actively choosing to be a better version of himself. And maybe he was having discussions here and there where, where then the PR machine was helping him and, and saying, what the hell are you doing? Why are you doing this in Vegas? Why are you doing this? And, you know, why are you pulling these antics? They were challenging him and he was willing to listen. But ever since he has rejected every any notion of that and kind of embraced that narcissistic side saying, how dare you question me? How, you, how dare you say anything to me? I can do whatever I want. Ever since that's the case, except of course, Megan has full say on whatever he does. I think ever since he's he's embraced that and then doesn't have that PR lens protecting him in any way or challenging him in any way, we are seeing the worst side of him on full display. Question from Mojo. If Diana was here, would this be happening? No, I think uh, the whole reason uh, that any of this is happening is because he has very, very intense mother issues. Uh, and having lost his mother at such a young age, I think uh, Megan has played up on that, played on that. She's uh, really leaned into it, wearing his perfume, dressing like her, similar gestures, similar stories uh, of, of, of suffering. Um, I think she's played that, tried to play that mother replacement role and given him an opportunity to play out that fantasy of saving his mother, which if you watch that Oprah interview, it was so much meant to, so much of it was meant to evoke that, that she, you saved us, Harry, you saved us. And, you know, she's clutching her, her belly at the same time. I think, um, she, she gave him that opportunity to play that, that fantasy. If Diana was okay today, he would be running away from a woman like that. Agent Orange is wondering whether Harry needs counseling for his mother's death. I think he's gotten a lot of counseling. I don't think it's been the right counseling particularly. Uh, I think, I don't know. I don't, uh, I'm don't. i not sure actually how to answer that, to be honest. What do you think, Sean? Well, um, well oh, it's really horrible, isn't it, to have to go mm. through that for anyone. It's the worst possible thing in the world that you could imagine. I mean, even just watching the portrayal of it in The Crown, which is a lot of it's fabricated and stuff, Yes. Y your heart definitely goes out for anyone who's lost a family member at such a tender age. And I can't imagine the trauma that that would be exacerbated by the media, by the stories. And then as you get older, you start to read, for example, in Diana, her own words, the book, she's talking about Charles bumping her off and it would be made to look like a car crash. Imagine if you're the son reading your mother's own words, saying something like that, how it would affect you psychologically. So I can see how he's got a void in his soul that's been created by his mother's death. I, I see that as a root cause. P people who are traumatized, I mean, trauma is, is one of the root causes of narcissism and other mental ailments and to get counseling is a definite must i think if people want to have happy healthy lives after they've been through horrific things yes yes all right. Agree. all right so um will we see megan behaving badly for trash tv that's the next question for you <laughs> i don't know I, I i could totally see her on trash tv um i could see her on a real housewives type um, because nothing else is working out for her. I think I could see her trying anything. I don't think we'll ever stop hearing from Megan, to be honest. I think she's going to try for the rest of our lives for sure. <laughs> from Ian, do you think that much of the Diana adulation was due to her good looks and the halo effect? Yes, I think had Diana still been alive today, I think we would have seen her as a much more real figure.
then, um, you, you know, she had she had a lot of incredible qualities, especially in the kind of um, work that she did with nonprofits. I think she she had a beautiful ability to feel for people suffering, uh, but she had flaws just like anybody else does. And I think that's the main difference between Prince Harry and Prince William is that because Prince William was older, he started to see his mother as a, as a real person rather than just this idealized version of mother. Uh, I think he saw where she was flawed, where I don't, I don't think he, William saw their marriage, his, the marriage between his mom and dad as this, as just being, you know, his father's fault. I think he saw the, the negative impact that Diana's behavior had on his father, just like um, negative impact that, uh, you know, uh, Charles's, uh, Charles's behavior had on Diana. I think he saw the equal side of it and he didn't like that he was getting pulled into it as well by his mother. I think had she continued to live, Prince Harry would have seen that too over time. I think that's just the natural evolution of growing up is you start to see your parents as more human. And I think that's how the public would have seen her too. There are good things about her, there are bad things about her. What happened with her was that she died so young, so beautiful, just incredibly beautiful, that she never really became a real figure after that. She became, she kind of just became this figure of stone, you know, she's just perfect. And, and, and that's how we like to look at her. So Billy's wondering whether Diana would not have had affairs if Charles had been completely faithful to her. Hard to say. But, you know, per Lady C, who is so well versed in, in the behaviors of, uh, of the upper class, uh, in British upper class, she says that having affairs is quite normal as long as you make sure that the, 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 uh, there are no children from the affairs and that it's very clear who the children are from. She says that it's quite com common. So I don't know what to make of it. Um, I would say it's, it's, it's hard to say. You know, can't mind read I mean, on her. I mean, I mean, look at the, Camilla was married when Charles was having an affair with her, and, and he was. Yes. Let's just all go and have some polo together. <laughs> just, all right, anyway. Yes, and just, and Diana's <laughs> mother was having an affair and ran off with with you know with a man. So I mean, it, that's what Lady C says is that it was actually it's like quite rampant. The affairs are quite rampant. <laughs> Deborah's wondering whether Prince William should still keep far from Harry and Meghan. As far as is humanly possible. Prince William, just don't even allow him in the same room as you. Don't breathe the same air as him. Question from Kerbick. Could Harry suffer from BPD? Uh, BPD is something that's very close to me. Um, it's something I've researched very heavily. I am not a psychologist, so just take it with a pinch of salt. I don't think he's suffering from BPD. Uh, BPD is this is this very volatile, intense, emotionally intense, uh, you know, uh, personality disorder where people go from highs to lows. They don't know how to control their own sense of self. They have no sense of self. I think after Harry is out of this relationship, whenever that's going to be, maybe it's, he's gonna, it's gonna be when he's 50 or 60, we're gonna see him go back to his normal self and he, he'll, he'll be a perfectly healthy, normal person uh, as much as people are willing to let him back. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, BPD is something that affects you for the rest of your life, affects you for the rest of your life. Uh, I don't think, I think he's su suffering from narcissistic abuse, but beyond that, I, I don't think he has a personality disorder per se. So is that, referring to board, is that referring to borderline or bipolar? Uh, it's borderline personality disorder. Okay. Yes. All That's right. what, um, what Amber Heard suffers from is like the more famous example. Okay. Gigi wants to know if it's possible Meghan and Harry are being used by governments or powerful people and are in too deep or unawares. Um... I think they wish that they were in with the powerful people. I don't think they're being used by powerful people. I, I don't, I think they're attempting to do all the using. I, I don't see them actually. <laughs> I think people would just hope that they go away. I, I don't think that the Democratic Party wants anything to do with them, anybody. I think Megan is more the puppet master than a puppet 
herself. Yes, the narcissistic supply is only to flow one way, and that's to the narcissists. All right, Ian, I think we've touched on this earlier. I don't know if you want to add anything. Taken in the round, is royalty a bit of an anachronism to the dominance of parliament? It's, as I said earlier, that it's, it's more of a symbol that the royal family needs to serve as a symbol of what it means to be inherently British. I think that's their role and that's what they should they are doing i think they're doing that really well Ooh, before you answer this question from ian about what you think of the diana statue george the giant slayers popped in george oh all, all, all hail sean and mm -hmm. the amazing baggage claim what an incredible show you're both absolutely brilliant with incredible insight humor and wits love listening to you both and i would urge people all three of us were on george's channel just about a week or so ago, and I would urge the viewers to please go over and check that broadcast out. It had a special yes. guest appearance from Baby Ziggy, and uh, <laughs> it was it, it was doing really well last time I looked. The real um, star, yes, <laughs> he's so sweet. And we and I'm going to be on George the Giant Slayer's uh, stream on uh, this coming Sunday, so tune in for that. Fantastic. So, what do you think of Diana's statue? I think they should have picked a better belt. I don't know why, but that belt really got to me. But um, uh, they should have picked something a little more timeless. I think it was very 80s, very 90s. Uh, I, I just didn't think it quite captured her. But it is that strange, strange thing that you to capture someone in statue, that a face that people know so well is very, very hard. And I don't think that the, the artist did the best job, unfortunately. So Stephanie's wondering why the Biden admin won't allow Harry's visa to be shown to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, because I think it shows that the Biden administration doesn't really um, doesn't really enforce U.S. laws very well at all at all i mean look at the border situation again i'm gonna stray away from all the political talk but i think it's all part of that is that they they're they play favorites they they you know rules for thee not for me and i think harry falls into the the protected class of that statement does that include hunter by any chance majorly unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> whose cocaine is this i don't know <laughs> we won't look into it <laughs> no big deal maybe it was bill clinton's all right Just so hanging around <laughs> gg um wouldn't the drama between harry and megan be a great way to divide the uk and the us i'm referring to harry and megan being manipulated by governments i I think it's had the opposite effect, though. I think uh, it's brought the U.S. and the U.K. together more. Uh, in fact, Prince William is just so popular in America. He's far more popular than than uh, a lot of other figures. I think the Harry and Meghan drama really brought uh, the American people closer to the royal family and, and the symbolism of the royal family. I think it's been very positive. We're down to 15 minutes left with baggage claim. Please get your questions in. Last shout. And we've got Deborah. Do you think Charles should take more action against Harry and Meghan, i.e. letting us know he's not representing the crown? Anything, ha anything Charles does that's really intense um, and assertive, Harry's just going to turn around and use it as a victim, as part of their victim narrative and try to create, do more race baiting. Uh, and I think that that, especially in this climate is a very dangerous thing. My guess is that all the harsh action is gonna come when Prince William ascends to the throne, whenever that might be. Hopefully it's some years from now, uh, wishing, you know, wishing that uh, King Charles actually makes a, a proper recovery. I think William is going to be the, the sort of acts that's going to fall on Prince Harry. And it'll also allow for some time to pass where the race baiting stuff really settles down. It's not the right time to do it now. Jake wants to know whether Harry should be stripped of all titles and associations with the crown. 
Um, yes, I, I, I think, yes, he should be. But if any of that action comes, it should come from the parliament. But I don't think the parliament is actually able to strip him of his princely title. That's a birthright. Uh, I think they can strip him of the duke and du ducal title. But that means that then Meghan can style her as a herself as a princess. Because if the ducal title is gone, then she can say, I'm, you know, prince, I, I'm Princess Harry. So I think that's how it works. It's like I'm Princess Harry or something. I don't know uh, specifically around that. But um, she will use that even more. She'll be even happier with that. So, you know, they can they can do it, but I don't think then the, they actually end up winning. So I'm kind of going back on what I'm saying is I think let them have the titles for now, but I do think that they should try to take more effort to stop them from using them. Like on the website, they're using, they're using their titles even more to make money. So I don't think that that's a good thing. Question from Billy, despite the conspiracy theories about Harry's biological father, the older he gets, the more he's seeing Prince King Charles's in him when he's looking at his face do you agree with this baggage yes i do I, I i don't believe um that rumor that he's not actually prince charles's son i i think it's very clear you can see it on in his yeah and he has a lot of spencer in him as well he, he looks he looks like he's part of that family for sure ian's asking why do royalty and posh people have loads of first names but no real <laughs> surnames <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Sean. I feel like you might know the answer to this one more. I'm American, <laughs> so I can have that excuse. I think the names are ancillary to the titles, and it is a society of who's got the biggest, baddest titles. Money. We've got all the money. We've got all the power. All that's left is a hierarchy of titles. So, and <laughs> the titles Marie, will fight it out. <laughs> Yep, Anne Marie, do you think this year could be Meghan's downfall? Ooh. I think her downfall has already happened. The downfall really was the documentary. I saw such a shift in in the public perception of her at that time. Uh, until then, it was a lot of you know it was like sort of select few um, commentators talking about it. But when that documentary came out my entire TikTok feed was just flooded with people saying this is this is the most ridiculous thing and i don't think they knew the details like the rest of us knew who had been following this saga for the last you know how however many years they saw the you, you know you put a camera close enough to a narcissist and you can see just how insincere they are about everything and just even the slight thing of 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 her of Megan calling Harry H all the time, just really rubbed people the wrong way. They just felt like this was, this was just so, um, it all felt so insincere. And a narcissist has, I think they're always working against a time, like a ticking time bomb. There's, there's a shelf life that a narcissist has in any given environment. And I, I, I always give it like, it's about two, two to two and a half years is when people start to really realize that this person's not who they say they are. Uh, sometimes for some people, it takes far less time, but others, it takes about two and a half years is my guess. And with her, that documentary, it was just way too close where she thought she was being genuine, but everybody could see through that facade. And since then, I mean, they have been in such a down spiral at, I mean, and it was kind of kind of confirmed with what happened with South Park. Do you think that Meghan should enter politics? She's obviously a lot smarter than most Democratic politicians, after all. <laughs> uh, she's better at manipulating people, but she's not smarter. No, I don't think she's smarter. Uh, I think if you look at someone like Gavin Newsom is much smarter than uh, Meghan Markle. If she were smarter, she would actually know that know um, how to play the game better. I don't think she actually knows how to play the game well enough. She thinks she's too smart. Uh, please, dear God, let her not enter politics. But if she does, she will get ripped to shreds because everything's going to come out and no one's going to protect her. Yeah. She's not going to have a Frank Frank Underwood character protecting her. Um, we've got, this is a lovely comment from Gigi. Baggage claim, so good to hear from a sensible American. Thank you for filling us in on this from across the pond. That's so oh, sweet. That's nice. Thank you. 
Agent Orange, have the royal kids' blood been tested for percent? (laughs) 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 Who knows? (laughs) She'll come out with a fact and say she's, you know, she's like part Cherokee. Megan will come out and say (laughs) something like that in a couple of years, I'm sure, when the Nigerian, part Nigerian thing's not working for her anymore. (laughs) We're down to the last 10 minutes with baggage. Get the questions in, please. Ian? What was the worst sliding door moment in recent royal times? What does that mean, sliding door moment? Um, I think mishap. Ah, for the royals in recent times. I think Prince Andrew. I mean, that was that was terrible. And then letting Prince Andrew sit down and talk about it. I mean, it was it, it, it was all awful. He was he's been the biggest blotch, I think, on the royal family in the oh, last his five BBC. years. His BBC interview. Oh my God! Oh, that was just uh, that was a train wreck. It was just too too much, too much. It is frightening how Megan seems to only imitate real emotion rather than feeling or experiencing it. Is that a symptom of malignant narcissism? Um, I don't know about the symptom part of it, but it's absolutely true that you can see. And that you know, brings me back to that point from the Netflix documentary when they were feigning uh, fear because supposedly they were being followed by some paparazzi. And there was this one guy on a bicycle who seemed to be doing his own thing. And they're like looking behind, they're like, <gasps> you know, they were trying to really uh, sell us that narrative, but they are hunted and they're, they're, um, they're hurt as if she doesn't love every camera that's on her and finds it immediately and smiles. <laughs> you know, she knows exactly where it is. It's, I find that very interesting is that you never see photos of Catherine looking directly into the camera and you always find a photo of Megan looking directly into a camera or setting it up perfectly where her hand is like this. And she's like, you know, she's always posing for it. I think, um, the, the emotion that she does emulate on there, it's very, feels very, very, very fake, very forced. Uh, that whole scene where she's saying, you're scaring me, you know, are the kids safe? Are, are the doors locked? You can just, you can just feel the fakeness of it. Uh, it's the same way that people responded to Amber Heard on the stand when she was fake crying without any tears. Um, people felt like there was, it was just, it was like a soulless crying. It wasn't, it was like all acting. None of it was real. Uh, and it felt like the same with the documentary. Last five minutes, get your questions in folks. Do you think Harry hates Uncle Andrew? I don't know. I don't have anything to go off of. I've not really looked at their interactions at all, but I would imagine that the whole family kind of hates what he's done. He's really he's really jeopardized the family in a lot of ways. Question from French, and that is, if Prince Harry was born a prince, is it true that he cannot have his princely title removed? Don't quote me on this, but I, 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 I'm pretty sure I've heard... I've heard uh, uh, Lady C talk about this, about that it is a birthright and you can't revoke that, but I, I, I'm not sure. Now, now that I think about it, I'm not really sure. Someone's pitching in with Parliament can take away the Prince title. They did it for one of Queen Victoria's grandkids that lived in Germany. I remember that case in particular because they did that because at that time there was this concern. It was during World War II and there was this concern of, of treason. Um and so that there was like a, there was a reason that they could do that. I don't know if they can invoke that same law in this case around treason. So I think that's the question: is that do they actually have the power to do that without without the the treasonous aspect? But you could make an argument that what Prince Harry is doing is quite treasonous. I'm getting asked to bring Ziggy in because I'm bowing out in five minutes as well. But I'll I'll pull a question up while I go and see if he's away. Sounds good. Sounds good. I'm going to take over the live stream. It's my turn. (laughs) Did Meghan know Prince Andrew before officially meeting at Buckingham Palace? 
This is a saucy question, you guys. As if you know something about some boat behavior that people have been hinting. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't know. To be honest, I have not dug uh, into uh, her past. Her very, a very um, questionable past, where she might have been angling to meet some famous people and earn some money that way. I don't know. Uh, I think um, to, in the meantime, wait, here's another question. I'm so late. Question, what is King Charles III's worst oh, fear regarding Harry? Yeah. Oh, hi. Hi, sweetie. He's still on the screen. Oh, beautiful Oof. baby. <laughs> um, Hello, Ziggy. Hi, Ziggy. <laughs> hi. Hello. He has such beautiful eyes. He's such a sweet oh, baby. Thank you. We've got beautiful. a question on the we've got a question on the screen. What mm -hmm. is King Charles' worst fear, re Harry? I think his worst fear is that Harry will unalive himself. I think that that's my my perception of it. Sorry to talk about it while there's a cute little baby on screen. But uh, if I'm answering honestly, I think that's one of the reasons that. Charles doesn't go nuclear with him um, and, you know, strip him of any sort of path back. I think he always wants to keep some sort of path back uh, for Harry whenever Harry's ready to change his ways. Right. We're almost at the end. And what a fascinating journey. We've gone back throughout history. We've, we've analyzed the royals. And um, Baggage Claim, please let the viewers know where they can find you and support you. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me on, Sean, and with your lovely boy. Uh, so again, my name is Baggage Claim. You can find me on YouTube by searching Baggage Claim or follow me on Twitter at Baggage Claim 11. And if you're looking for commentary on what's going on socially, where things have started to go wrong, what might have caused that, how we can crawl back from, from the negative path that we seem to be on at the moment, check out my channel for content like that. And what are you going to be discussing on George the Giant Slayer's channel coming up? I'm not sure. I have to ask him. But I think we might be talking about Marvel. I have to check in. But I'm excited what, for what, that stream. What day and time is that at so that we can uh, let the viewers know? It's on, uh, it's on Sunday, UK time. I don't know what the UK time is, but for California time, it's going to be 12 p.m. 12 p.m. All right. And yes. Baggage claims links are in the description box below this video. Please go down and support her work. Check out what they're doing on George's channel. And if you want to see more Ziggy, he's on the Atwood Family channel, which is a separate channel to this. And there's lots more of him over there. And he's smiling like crazy tonight. He <laughs> That's is. great. <laughs> Sean, thank you so much for having me on. This was wonderful. And thank you, everyone, for the very engaging questions. They were incredible. Oh, thank you too. Yeah, thank you viewers for all the questions and hope to see you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Right, on to the next guest. Do -do -do -do. Travis, how are you? Good to see you again. Hey, good to see you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. I, I, do, do I remember correctly that the last time we spoke, or when I interviewed you, I think, was you lying down because of an injury of some sort? Yeah, I had a pain condition for nearly five years, so I was oh my God. almost always in bed. <laughs> but thankfully, I figured that out, and I'm uh, back to normal now. Good so, to hear it. Yeah, I, I was just wondering yeah. if I'd imagine that a moment ago before. Yeah, but you, yes, but that, that's some that's some testament that that you can uh, you can do an excellent interview in bed, basically, and, and still be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had I had to. I didn't really have any choice, so um, I often had my little dog with me. And now she's trying to get on my lap, but um, yeah. <laughs> She's free, she's free to make an appearance if she wants. So, I mean, I've enjoyed your your work of, of a lot over the last few years. So, I mean, we've got a few mutual associates and friends, I think. And I'm always very interested in the topics that you kind of, you know, drop, put your attention on. And I'm just wondering um, now why the focus on gender ideology or trans rights activism? Because I think anyone who's spent more than five minutes poking around in that world tends to find themselves on the end of some pretty egregious uh, accusations and sometimes threats. So wh why poke that hornet's nest? 
Yeah, yeah, it is. It is a difficult and frankly toxic topic. Um, it's it's really difficult to to, to navigate. Uh, with my previous series, as I think we discussed before, the woke reformation, I was covering all kinds of woke topics, identity politics topics, and gender was just going to be another episode of my series. But then, uh, you know, I got in touch with Helen Joyce, who invited me to a conference on gender where I interviewed a ton of people, amazing people, Stella O'Malley, who runs Genspect, Marcus and Sue Evans, um, Menno, Buck Angel, a bunch of people. And I realized that this topic was so much bigger than I realized. And so I decided to make its own, to make it its own series. Um, and in general, I'm interested in this stuff because wherever I see dogmatic black and white cult like thinking, I'm immediately interested because I, I find it really fascinating how ideology just can completely derange people's lives and cause them to do, in this case, real physical damage, damage to, to children and to, and to people in general. So that, that was why I was interested in the, in the topic. That's a good answer, and it's it, it's a big one, isn't it? And I, th this idea of ideology ideology fascinates me too. And I suppose with, I suppose there's there's parallels to draw here. I mean, you mentioned cult like thinking. There's parallels to draw with religion, I suppose. And it, it's kind of it seems kind of um, easy to see how religions have taken hold in a sense because they've got you know thousands of years uh, of pressure and sometimes war to back them and things like that. Feels like to me that gender ideology seems to have just gone from nothing to almost everywhere overnight. I don't really think sort of 2014, 2013, we were having long form debates about what a woman is. So, I mean, what, what's Correct. happened here to make it, you know, rise to every level of our sort of academia, the, you know, the media cycle, politics, culture, art, how, how has it traveled so far and so quickly? Yeah, I think there's a few answers to that question, but the, the first one that you kind of touched on, uh, with religion, I think religion is likely an evolutionary adaptation. And given the fact that traditional religion has been declining, something new is, I think, inevitably going to take its place because I think we're just hardwired to, most of us, I know you and I are not religious, uh, not in any tr traditional sense, but most people are seeking for some kind of meaning, some kind of higher purpose, some kind of connection to something greater than themselves. So I think that does explain at least some of the trend in, in terms of why people are now latching onto identity politics, race, you know, gender, mm -hmm. specifically the trans issue. And the trans issue in particular tells, especially young kids, that they can transcend themselves. They can become something else, which is one of the um, great interviewees. I, I interviewed uh, Lisa Marciano. She talked a lot about that in my first episode. But so that that's one of the, I think, the underlying factors. And then, of course, you have the usual suspects, you know, TikTok and YouTube push this stuff um, and kids get caught up on it uh, with it online. And then people have adopted this as if it's a new progressive civil rights movement or it's the new frontier of the civil rights. We've already won all of the other battles, more or less, you could you could argue. And so now trans is is the new battle that people feel like they need to to push for um but the the problem is is it's not the same it's not even remotely the same so <laughs> it's uh you know it, being being so-called trans is not like being gay you people don't have a choice as to whether or not they're gay um and being trans is it, it, all that really means is that a person has gender distress or distress about their body and that distress can be alleviated in a number of ways the ways that the trans activists are pushing for it is that, well, the only way to alleviate that distress is to get, you know, life altering drugs and surgeries and essentially become sterile um, and often lose sexual function. I mean, these we just don't have good outcomes uh, um, from from these procedures. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll definitely pick back upon that in a minute. But something I always like to ask on uh, during these kind of converse conversations, especially with people that I think we pretty much, you know, agree with on pretty much every aspect of this. Uh, you brought up the idea of maybe TikTok influencing there, and there's this idea of social contagion, which I think is credible. Uh, also, you know, the idea that perhaps gender dysphoria requires more medical treatment and support rather than perhaps affirmation and, and surgery. But to a lot of people, and I don't know if we're a, a similar age or not, I might be a bit older than you, I don't know. A lot of people uh, see this as a, a parallel to how attitudes were towards homosexuality in the generations before us. You know, this idea that it's a, it's a medical condition 
and it's something you could be convinced of by other gay people. You can catch the gay kind of attitude. <laughs> what kind of checks and balances can we put in place here to make sure that's not what we're doing? We're not just falling into this trap of getting older, becoming more conservative and not understanding progressive new things. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's always good to question our assumptions and our biases. I think it's good to be self-reflective. I think you just have to look at this issue as objectively as possible. And as soon as you start reading, you know, the studies and, and various books, you know, I tried to read both sides of, of every argument uh, that I touch on, but it, it becomes very clear that this is not the same thing as being gay. I mean, there have been many studies where, you know, a huge percentage of kids who had gender dysphoria grew out of it, you know, something like 88% of boys naturally grow out of it. And so that's, that's without any treatment that's just going through puberty and many of them turn out to be to, actually turned out to be gay <clears throat> but the reality is is that um after all of the therapists and psychiatrists and people that i've inter interviewed it, it seems pretty clear to me that basically everyone can alleviate their their distress through the appropriate manner through psychotherapy through getting their physical health better through engaging with the world getting offline uh, you know getting away from the social contagion aspect of it so i think you know once a person starts to dive into this topic it does become clear that this is this is a distinct thing this is not like i said it's not the new frontier of civil rights yeah and they're looking at some of the people you interviewed uh, i think helen joyce bit Ellen's lovely. I'm a big fan of her work. I think I, I got an advanced copy of her book and I kind of reading that I, had, I kind of had the same feeling I had when first reading something like The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. It seemed like it was the right time, right place to kind of spearhead some sort of pushback to something that felt very religious. I mean, you've, you've interviewed yeah. Book Angel and Mr. Men, all these people I've either interviewed and met as well. And that they're kind of, you know, very staunchly against this new trans rights ideology. Uh, right. I was just wondering, did you get to speak to anyone who was kind of all in on the gender ideology, who kind of believes this sort of, you know, trapped in the wrong body kind of hypothesis? Yeah, I mean, privately, I've spoken to them, but they typically don't want, I mean, I, and I did the same thing for the woke reformation. I reached out to people in African studies departments or gender studies departments to see if they'd be interested in giving their opinion. And they just aren't, um, you know, so I, it's, it's an unfortunate uh, uh, gap that I can't seem to bridge, but uh, I'd be happy to interview somebody on, uh, you know, who's more kind of all in. Um, like I said, I've, I've done Zoom calls with people like that and they've expressed some interest, but then when it came down to it, they just wouldn't follow up or they, you know, don't return my emails or whatever. And I'm nothing but cordial to, to these people. I, you know, I'm not like, oh, I'm, out, I'm out to get you. I'm, I'm going to do a gotcha. I'm not Matt Walsh. I'm not any of those people. So, um, no, it's, I, unfortunately, I haven't been able to. Um, so that's why I do my own research. I try to read and watch as much as possible of what these people say so that I can understand it and then ultimately see if it makes any sense. And if it doesn't, then counter it. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. And I, I kind of feel your pain on that front because, I mean, first of all, it's worth pointing out, you're absolutely right. Your content is very much sit down and have a discussion, try and find out what we know and how we know it. It's very professional uh, as well. It's not like you say, you're not, you're not a gotcha merchant in any sense. But whenever I've been kind of on street level covering protests on, on these kind of things from all sorts of topics, not just necessarily the gender one, uh, the people who would be considered anti-woke are more than you know, uh, happy to talk to me on camera and give me answers. Those defending the more far left progressive views are really reluctant to the point where it very rarely happens. And I suppose yeah. that then creates a false perception of your reputation that you're only covering either one side of the argument or that's all you're about, which further puts people off from the other side from speaking to you. Yeah, yeah. And at this point, I've I've honestly given up caring. I've given up trying. <laughs> because, I mean, not only do I do that, but I, I travel around with Peter Bogosian a lot and we film a, a lot together. And he's tried to do that many times as well. We both put in a lot of effort to do that. And at this point, I'm just I'm done with it. I, I don't care anymore. People can call my work far right propaganda. I'm not on the far right. I'm not even on the right, really. So, you know, people will draw their own conclusions. Um, I think most people are are not in this sort of lunatic fringe and most people can watch something see what it whether or not it makes sense to them whether or not it aligns with their values and then they can just decide from there are you quite more optimistic about the pushback to this ideology because it seems to me like when i've been kind of 
I, I was heavily pushed back in against, pushing back against Islamic fundamentalism. I know you have, and it, but to many people, it seems quite esoteric in terms of knowing what the religion's about, what it proposes, the different kind of schisms within it. Uh, they, I think a lot of people are kind of just assume, you know, secularists that it's perhaps just a, a different, you know, a different their version of Christianity, perhaps, and they don't right. know that you know the differences there and how that can manifest. Whereas with this debate, I think everyone instinctively knows what a man and a woman is. And it seems very hard to get it over that point. And I think people have reached a kind of breaking point with it. And I certainly think that probably tacks on to the the, the safety and well-being of children that's caught up in it. Are, are you optimistic about turning this whole thing around? Yeah, and I guess it depends on the on the day. Um, <laughs> I spend so much of my time, you know, doing research and downloading clips of the insane crap that people say and and then just looking at some of these surgeries and like it gets it get, I get bogged down with that but I realize that I have a very narrow view into this world because I'm making a film about it. But, you know, you do see, I mean, people publish stuff about this all the time that, um, you know, people are winning, uh, you know, loss, filing lawsuits, like detransitioners, like my friend Camille Kiefel is filing a lawsuit um, because of her double mastectomy. Uh, so you see more and more lawsuits and you also see more and more of these gender affirmation laws changing uh, but it, it really depends on where you know like so florida is probably much better than the west coast you know on the west coast in california and certainly in, or in oregon you know 15 year olds are basically considered adults they can get double mastectomies without their parents consent i mean it's truly insane so you know it, it's 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 a mixed bag I, I do think as you said most people just instinctively know i mean 15 years ago like you said, no one was arguing about what a man or woman what is, and um, and we all just knew instinctively that this is a bad idea to you know sterilize children or mutilate them. I mean, it clearly, <laughs> obviously, um, what's a little depressing is there's there's now a lot of, or at least there's probably has been around for a while, but I've come in contact with a lot of like infighting on the sort of gender critical side. That's um, that's a bit depressing. I don't really want to go into that too much, but it's. Uh, yeah, it, it just kind of sucks because it feels like the main things we should focus on are, you know, saving children from these surgeries and hormones and, and puberty blockers and then keeping single sex spaces, single sex. Uh, and then the other stuff, what pronouns people use, whatever, you know, I think that all that stuff is is really obviously secondary. Um, but some people get very uptight about that. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think I think I know exactly what you're referring to. And I, I kind of watched that from a distance and, and sat that one out and thought that's just a waste yeah. of everyone's time and energy for yeah. for sure when they are bigger issues. But getting back to this I idea of the kind of uh, harms this is doing to minors, it, and on the face of it, it does sound a lot like right wing conservative fantasies, you know, think of the children, you know, and <laughs> I, I have a very hard time explaining to people the reality of it i mean i can point to something like the tavistock clinic in the uk you'll be well aware of was closed down for serious serious failings in this regard i think there is something there's something like three thousand active legal proceedings against that clinic now in the name of these minors uh, and, and parents as well you, you know you spoke about various states in america i mean how, how big of a problem is this in terms of terms of the affirmation model and what this is doing to children in terms of surgery and the the progression it's putting them on yeah, well, the, the first thing I'd say is a, a lot of people say, oh, well, it's not happening to very many kids. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, f first of all, we, we don't have all of the numbers because it's very difficult to get those numbers. For one, like the Tavistock, Marcus Evans told me that they didn't keep any follow-up data at all uh, on, on how these kids progress, whether or not they were successful uh, taking puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, how, how it affected their lives. No, no one kept data. The only people that I know of that kept data were the Dutch and that the, the dutch protocol or study as it's known was actually really really faulty uh one of the patients died um michael biggs talks a lot about that the sociologist but in terms of um in terms of the numbers one thing i think people have to realize is regardless of the fact that thousands and thousands of kids are now being affirmed and and the numbers have skyrocketed komodo health did a study on this that you can find online but even outside of that, even outside of the kids who are being affirmed and actually getting the hormones and, and surgeries, hundreds of thousands, if not more, uh, of children are being taught a wrong model about biological sex. So that's going to have downstream consequences, even if they don't identify as trans or non-binary or whatever. So I think the ripple effects are a lot 
broader. Uh, and I think the problem is worse even outside of the really egregious cases of kids actually getting these these surgeries. But in, in the first episode, I, I lay out the data that we have, which is based on insurance claims on how many, you know, girls under the age of 18 are give, getting double mastectomies, how many young children are being put on puberty blockers. And it's, and it's unfortunately um, a, a lot. It's, it's in the, the hundreds and, and the thousands, depending on the, on the year, or if you tally it cumulatively. But, um, but again, that's only insurance claims. So you have a lot of people that crowdfund for this stuff. You have people that just pay out of pocket for their children or their friends' children or you know, get money from an online community. So that doesn't even reflect all of the numbers anyway. So uh, I, I think it's, it's worse than people like to say that it is. Yeah. I mean, I'm really fascinated with you, you mentioning there about being taught the wrong information about biological sex is having a, a knock on effect. And I, I still, I'm still actually struggling to get my head around why doing that's even necessary. Because, I mean, as we know, it is just a fact of mammalian biology that, you know, yeah, human sex is binary, it's immutable. By binary, we mean it's male and female. Uh, and that can't be changed. But for me, there's nothing about that about my identity that that I need for that to be true. There's nothing, I'm not kind of hanging anything on that. It's just a fact uh, of nature. And for me, just as a sort of left-leaning liberal who cares about, you know, individual rights, there's, there's nothing about that fact of reality that should stop a trans person living as the opposite sex uh, and identifying however they want, wearing whatever they want, living the life they want without, you know, harassment, censorship, abuse, anything like that. So, I mean, at what point, I mean, why have we got to this point where people are going beyond the, beyond the kind of classic liberal position on this to actually trying to push abject falsehoods about uh, biological reality? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's tricky because I, I shared those that same disposition. You know, I, when someone's an adult, if they want to dress as the opposite sex or get surgeries or whatever they want to do, as long as they're not affecting other people in a negative way, then I'm, uh, of course, I don't know why I would care. I'm not an authoritarian. Hmm. Um, there are people who do care, and that's a little strange to me. But uh, yeah. the problem is that you know there's there's sort of a next step for a lot of people. So you know some men will dress up in women's clothes and then think that this gives them access to women's bathrooms or their changing rooms, or you know they'll identify prisoners will identify as female and then get access to women's prison and and then you know rapes occur and sexual abuse and this sort of thing so uh you know obviously there are really horrible effects that come with taking it beyond just just living out one's personal life uh, you know ostensibly as the the opposite sex um and then and then again you know when it comes to children in particular people whose brains are not fully formed it's very confusing and there are people who you know you and i probably never think about gender or our sexed bodies. At least I, I don't. Um, and I know, think about I'm, yours sometimes, Travis. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't think, I don't think of it in terms of like, I'm confused or, you know, I, I wish that I was something different, but there are people who do struggle with that. And I think we have to acknowledge that uh, that's a real thing. But again, what, what are, what are the right pr procedures, you know, medical procedures or psychological interventions for those people? That's the question. I think. No, and that, that raises a great point because I really worry about this because I think sometimes, I, I mean, I think I'm guilty of this in a sense of, of kind of perhaps not necessarily losing empathy, but not <clears throat> being as focused on it as possible. Because like you say, there are young people out there who are really struggling with something very real, you know, gender dysphoria. It's a lot it's a lot to take on for anyone. I think, you know, being a teenager is difficult for most people for many reasons. And then you throw that into the mix and obviously you've got yourself a very, very big struggle. And I, I just think, you know, given that we're all arguing about single sex spaces and preferred pronouns and where this is pushed in the workplace, which I admit is important stuff. I think the, the, the you know, the kind of safeguarding of children and making sure they have the support they need kind of gets, has got moved move to the side a little bit, would you say? Yeah. So, sorry, my screen shut off. So I was slightly distracted. Can you just resummarize that question again? Yeah, I think I, because many of us are in the trenches in this, and we get caught up in kind of pushing back against the excesses of gender ideology. We're not really focusing much of our attention on the, you know, the support that these kids suffering from oh, yeah. gender dysphoria need. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think that's true. I mean, some of this stuff is so 
repulsive when you see it or hear about it and it's depressing and it, and it, and it just, you know, it, it is, it's a kind of a deranging topic, honestly, um, regardless of what side someone's on, it's, it's easy to kind of lose one's bearings. So, but I, I do think it's important, like you said, to kind of remind ourselves of what the purpose of, you know, making documentaries like this or speaking out about this stuff, it, what that purpose is. And that's just to, to, keep harm from happening and to actually help those people. I mean, you know, I've talked to a number of detransitioners who were really struggling and often still are struggling. I mean, it's a very, very difficult thing to cut off some body parts or to, to have completely changed a person's appearance or, or body um, in a way that they can't really come back from. So I think we should have a lot of sympathy for these people and help them in whatever way we can. And, and, you know, uh, organizations like Genspec, they provide um, therapy or, or uh, money for therapy, I believe, for people who they call are lost in transition, people that don't know quite what to do. Maybe they've transitioned a little bit. That is, maybe they've taken some hormones but haven't had surgery, or maybe they have had surgery and want to detransition. So I think it's really important to to do that kind of work. And um, and yeah, to like you said, empathize with with the the kids and the, and the people, adults even that that have that i mean it's, it's a real experience what's causing the experience there can be a number of reasons but the reality is is they're struggling with that and i think you know we need to find ways to to address it agreed and i think it's probably important to point out at this point so a lot of kind of neutral observers it, it, it this you know constant discussion about you know mutilation and trans ideology it can on the face of it seem like we're talking directly about trans people either individually or as a whole and for me i i, I kind of forget sometimes because my whenever i engage with somebody on this topic who's who's pushing this kind of ideo ideology 99.9 percent .9 of the time they're a, they're a non-trans activist who's upholding this. I mean, you and I have interviewed yeah. numerous trans people who don't share in this ideology either. Trans people aren't some homogenous block all sharing the same political worldviews, right. all singing from the same hymn sheet, uh, as you know. So, I mean, I, I mean, maybe that's a good place to start, just explaining that trans people are just as diverse as, as any group and you have sort of, you know, religious trans people, atheist trans people, conservative, Republicans, everything in, in between. So, I mean, do you, th do you think we could do better to kind of you know amplify them you know non-orthodox um, voices absolutely yeah I, th I think that's really important i mean that that's one of the reasons i interviewed buck angel uh because buck is really passionately against uh you know transitioning children um you know and and i i think people get caught up in these these more minor disagreements um they, they may think that they're not minor i i do think that they're minor but uh, I, I think that regardless of whether or not we disagree with somebody, if it, if it's on something like what pronouns you should use or whatever, I think that's that's or or, or how you dress, you know, uh, yourself. Or if you're not encroaching on other people's liberty and other people's autonomy, I think you should be free to do what you want. So, I think having those voices in the room, whether they're you know people who identify as trans or or even people who may be sympathetic to some of the ideology, I. I Still think it's important to talk to those people to have conversations to figure out you know why they believe what they believe and then to try to get to to the truth as best we can and just to minimize as much harm as possible i mean that's that's really the primary goal here i and i or i think it should be i agree and i actually i sometimes feel a little bit sorry for the kind of the 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 unorthodox thinkers within the you know who are trans themselves i'm thinking of like book angel who you've mentioned people like debbie hayton uh right. rose of dawn the loads of people who have a kind of um centrist views perhaps uh some conservative some not and uh, and i feel like they they get it from both sides because obviously they get it from kind of right-wing conservatives maybe overtly religious who just hate them because they kind of throw them in the same category as something sinful perhaps and then the far left progressives who are so annoyed with them from for, for not singing from their him she she as well they seem very kind of homeless in this kind of political dispute yeah it's really unfortunate yeah they, they get hate from from all different sides and in not not just religious people but people that are just very staunchly, you know, sort of holding the line, as they say, against, you know, all, all trans people, because they think anyone who's trans is going to then transition somebody else or so I don't, I don't know what they think exactly. But um, yeah, it's really, it's unfortunate, especially because, again, these are generally people who just want to live their own lives and don't want to push their, their beliefs on other people. 
certainly don't want to push, you know, transitioning onto other people, especially kids. I mean, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a bummer that these people get thrown under the bus, um, both from these crazy trans activists and uh, people uh, sensibly, you know, on the, on the other side. Since interviewing, well, whilst interviewing rather people for this docu series uh, focused on gender, has have they relayed anything to you that's really surprised you? Because obviously, this is a, a topic you've you've kind of uh, dipped in and out of with a lot of your woke reformation stuff. You would have been keeping a keen eye on it. You pretty much you think you think you've heard everything on this topic. Then something blindsides you. Was there any kind of moment like that with you? Yeah, there, there's one in particular that I don't know if I can mention on, because of the graphic details, but I was interviewing the sociologist Michael Biggs that I mentioned earlier. I just asked him to lay out, you know, some of these surgeries and some of the procedures and some of the, the details there when young boys take puberty blockers, their, you know, sexual organs don't develop in certain ways and to like use other parts of their body to create, you know, neo vaginas and like mm. it's just some of those details are just really horrific um and shocking uh and then i guess also just what what's been most interesting to me is that with critical race theory of black lives matter or any of that stuff there's like often a kernel of truth somewhere in there you know there was systemic racism slavery did exist uh, it doesn't anymore obviously uh at least it's not sanctioned by the u.s government <laughs> um there there is slavery elsewhere in the world um but anyways the point is is that with this gender stuff there the only kernel of truth is that some people su suffer from gender dysphoria, but in terms of whether or not somebody can change sex, I mean, it's it's fundamentally obviously wrong. It's just not possible. And so I've sort of explored this idea with a few people that, you know, why why does it seem to be that the, these activists get so vitriolic and so angry and often, you know, or at least sometimes resort to violence? I mean, you have men dressed up as women pun punching women, you know, I mean, it, it's crazy and and i think the reason is because their ideology is so or their their mindset is so brittle and it's so anti reality that that what do you do you can't really have a rational conversation because as soon as you start having a rational conversation it breaks down it just immediately breaks down because it's so far from reality that there's no kernel of truth in the idea of people changing sex or somehow identifying into another sex i mean it's just impossible yeah, there's a there's a real good versus evil mentality that kind of animates a lot of these people that I don't share. I mean, are these no, I've never I've never like threatened anyone, you know, screamed at anyone, abused anyone in in service of my opinions. It's always about discussion, but I've been on the receiving end of yeah. that just for asking basic questions, which seems very strange to me. It seems like they've got a lot of their own identity riding on this. And I'm talking about, you know, trans activists, not transgender people. And yeah. I, I mean, this this does, for those of us that I'm, and I know it's a very easy comparison to make, but for those of us that have dipped our toes in the power of religious ideology and cult-like thinking over the years, it just feels like another version of that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you brought up identity. I think that that's that's obviously a key aspect to this. And, it, and it's key with all versions of identity politics. People get so wrapped up. And again, coming back to this idea of, of purpose and meaning, I think I think that's one of the discussions that people should be having more of, you know, as traditional religion is obviously declining. We do need something that unites us. We need something that gives us meaning and purpose. And people find that in their in their sort of victim identity status. Uh, and so, of course, people are going to hold on to that very tightly and get very angry when it's questioned. Um, and that happens, you know, all over the political spectrum with, you know, trans activists and non trans activists. It happens all, all over the place. Yeah. And I, you must have noticed this. And I don't know how you feel about this. Maybe maybe, maybe they've got you too, Travis. So we'll find out. But <laughs> this seems to, I think, one consequence of this kind of really unforgiving, non redemptive, prog you know, so called progressive, far left ideology of wokeness, whatever you want to call it, it seems to have made you know conservative christianity a lot more appealing to many people yeah. than perhaps it would have sure. been and i'm seeing yeah. seeing a, a resurgence of that and i'm seeing people coming in offering easy answers and kind of trojan horsing christian values in uh that way i, I don't know how you have you've noticed this as well oh for sure yeah yeah and i've also noticed just in general i mean it, it's often tied up with that but 
there is a problem on the anti-woke side or the anti-woke right um, that I think we should be aware of. And again, it's just, it's, it's human tribalism. I think it's natural for people to, to be groupish and then to find the evil and fight against it. And, and that's why I, I typically avoid using words like evil uh, and avoid that kind of thinking. Um, and I think, I think you can fight bad ideas and try to stop harm without necessarily falling into that category or at least being, you know, more judicious in, in terms of how you apply it. But, but yeah, so unfortunately, you know, more and more people seem to be pushing this idea of, oh, we, we just need to get back to traditional religion. That's going to solve the problem. I mean, it, it's really obvious that that's not true because woke ideology has infiltrated many religious institutions. Um, I, I don't know how, how many, I don't know what the percentage is, but you see this stuff all the time. I mean, I see it in the churches in Portland, you know, they have the trans flag, they, they have the Black Lives Matter flag, they have, you know, I saw basically what, what amounted to like a, a shrine of George Floyd in this Catholic church. I mean, so traditional religion is not going to protect you from this stuff either. Um, that, that being said, there are some values from Christianity that are obviously positive. Um, so I don't think we should just you know, discard all of them. But this idea that becoming Christian um, is going to sort of solve the problem, I think, is is short sighted. Good point. All right, Travis. Well, I could speak to you about this all night, I imagine. But I want to thank you for coming on. It's good to see you again. And maybe you can just let people know where they can find your new docu series. Yeah. So the first episode is out. Uh, it's currently only available for subscribers on my locals, which is travisbrown.locals.com. And then you can see other content uh, on YouTube, which is at Become the Signal. Uh, and then on locals, I've got other exclusive stuff that you can see as well. Awesome. Thanks, man. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye bye. This is that awkward moment where we fumble around trying to find the buttons. There we go. Uh, just bringing our next guest. Carlton, welcome to Outward Unleashed. How are you, sir? Hi, I'm very good. Thank you. Excellent. I'm really looking forward to a nice change of pace here on a topic that <laughs> I know I know absolutely nothing about. So you'll have to Please. forgive the, uh, the uh, I'm going to say wide-eyed curiosity, but it'll probably sound like stupid questions to you. So, I mean, no, uh, maybe... you know, no, no such thing as a stupid Question. That's good They're to hear. The hardest ones to answer. Yeah. We'll we'll see how you feel in the next twenty five minutes sure. about say sure. But maybe you can just let our viewers and listeners know uh, what it is you do, what keeps you busy. Uh, I'm uh, a lecturer in social science at the University of West of Scotland um, in Paisley. Um, that's kind of where I that pays the rent, so to speak. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I I'm here. I to talk about a book that I co-authored um, the beginning uh, of last year, which is a, a, a critical study of the of the county lines phenomenon, particularly in the UK and and, and in Scotland. Um, the, the the county lines phenomenon being the the, the so-called shift in the way that drug networks and, and, and drug lines uh, operate and they move from urban centers to peripheral rural mostly coastal towns to expand expand their markets so we spent we've spent my co-authors and i uh, james densley and robert mclean we've spent the last i suppose we kind of started this long before covid kicked in which seems like a, a million years ago um looking at some of the problems with some of the county lines narrative i suppose particularly within kind of uh policy making and, and, and policing and and basically arguing that the the county lines model doesn't necessarily fit all types of kind of drug dealing and to an extent that comes slightly problematic in the sense that it becomes a kind of standard story that's that's applied and used to kind of explain away perhaps other issues or other problems or dealing with um, uh, criminal illicit drug behavior in, in, in an appropriate, appropriate ways. Wonderful answer. Yeah. So there's a lot to get into there for sure. So what, what is the kind of standard narrative on county lines? And before we, we get onto your findings, what, what would one assume to hear when asking that question? Yeah. So uh, I think it was um, 
2015, the National Crime Agency provided uh, a, a definition of a county line. And county lines have been bubbling under within discussions around criminology, but also policing for, for a few years now. And it's an idea that's filtered over, but the, the, there are very different nuances to it, but it's kind of filtered over uh, from the states, uh, hence the term county lines. And it's this idea that urban drug gangs, because of the saturation of markets within ur large urban centers, migrate to more peripheral, rural towns, villages, uh, uh, to set up new uh, kind of drug markets. And essentially, they or the, the, the standard story is they do this through exploiting vulnerable people, uh, particularly children. So the classic narrative is that vulnerable children are identified and I suppose groomed into uh, the, the, the county lines networks where they carry drugs and cash uh, from these urban centers, usually on tra public transport, trains, etc., uh, to these peripheral uh, kind of out of town rural areas to uh, and establish drug markets so we've kind of taken a, a slightly more critical approach to that and particularly in the context of scotland where um our research is conducted the the county lines model is actually or rather the the way in which drug networks operate in scotland because of its geography and because of you know it's there are very few large, what you'd call large urban centers that um, the county lines model kind of fits the drug mark, the, the way that drugs have worked in Scotland for a very, very long pe for a ver very long period. And we thought that the, the kind of, but the standard, the kind of the standardization or the characteristics that are used to describe county lines don't fit. Uh, there's a very different story there, which we've tried to to uncover. It's not that we're saying that county lines don't exist, but what we're what we're saying is that that, that model that that model that I've just um, uh, outlined, hopefully, uh, doesn't fit all drug networks, um, uh, and it tends to to a degree that it becomes a kind of uh, self fulfilling philosophy. Or you know a self-fulfilling uh, uh, legacy, particularly within the way in which, importantly, the police relate to uh, and and police and regulate uh, illicit drug use and uh, illicit drug markets. Okay, so I mean, I, I mean, what we're talking here really is kind of you know a, a criminal, a criminality, criminal underworld, illegal activity. H how much more difficult does that make you uh, a, as a, a topic to research? The fact that it, it, you're talking about illegal behaviour here. So, I mean, how do you even find an in to investigate this? Where do you start? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really, really good question. And um, we were in a very, very fortunate and a very unique situation that one of the co-authors has uh, connections and a background in this area uh, which is very unusual for uh, particularly uh, research in illicit drug areas where you don't get access to the actual networks and the actual people dealing uh, the actual people transporting the drugs and things like that where we did um, and that, that kind of makes our case studies quite unique and that's solely because we were able to develop through uh, some of the researchers having close ties, not close ties, but grew up within kind of drug areas or areas that were kind of are known for drug uh, use in, in, in and around Scotland, that we were able to kind of utilize those networks and, and utilize those those relationships so that's kind of what makes the case our case studies um slightly unique within the within the area of, of this type of research is that we did have face-to-face hands-on contact with people working working in these in these networks
How difficult was it to earn their trust? I mean, you mentioned you co-author there already had connections in that world, but I mean, they must be, you know, an inst uh, these people must be, I would assume if they've been doing this for a long time, are probably very guarded, perhaps a little bit paranoid. How, how do you convince them that basically your intentions are, are pure? Uh, uh, my intentions are pure. I'm not, not sure I would want to uh, convince them of that, but uh, well, basically I didn't do that. Right. Because I have no r relationship with the with, with with these individuals, so I kind of stayed out of the the picture when th those relationships were were being built. I think kind of the the trust issues because we, as I said, some of the the, the researchers already had ins, and that that trust had already been established prior to the research taking place in the sense that friendships were already there or kind of credibility issues were already there. There were elements of trust that were already there, which we didn't have to kind of undertake the kind of these huge negotiations of these issues prior to the research taking place because they'd already been established. And we we made it very, very clear that, that all the names in the books, the towns, and um, they're all uh, anonymous. So the names in the books aren't the real names of the individual their stories are real um and the activities that they're involved in are real but their names are obviously not not real so it it was a case of individuals like me that have no connection with these people at all taking uh, pretty much taking a back seat and those researchers or those involved in the the, the making of the book uh, and the research who did have those very close uh, net relations with some of these people um, developing those at their own pace at their own speed and of course it wasn't all plain plain sailing there were individuals who didn't want to talk to us individuals who didn't who did talk to us and then said you're not using you know which is their right to do and we didn't um, we didn't do that we only used the material uh, and the relationships and the interviews and the observations that that were uh, that those individuals had agreed had agreed to okay well as i've not read the book and i, I will add it to my list because it's, it's fast it sounds fascinating to me and it's it's a world i have no concept of whatsoever so it's always going to be more interesting for that reason but i suppose the the kind of elephant in the room that hangs over conversations of this time a type is the sort of argument for the legalization of drugs so mm -hmm. we seem to have kind of competing narratives whichever end of the political spectrum spectrum you go to the people were i would say you know traditionally left to far left would call for the decriminalize decriminalization of drugs as a solution to you know gang crime exploitation other things in the peripherals like prostitution things like that those on the sort of conservative religious right would say it's all an abomination and you need to lock these drug dealers up and throw away the key and that'll sort out the drug problem uh, in your investigations for this book uh, uh, do you become a, a more sympathetic to one side more than the other what was your been your takeaway on that that issue i kind of yeah it's a, it's a really i think it's a really fundamental question and in and in some senses, although not directly, but I think in some indirectly, that's the the mess that we're trying to unpack within the book to an extent. Um, nowhere in the book, nowhere anywhere in in the kind of do we condone illicit drug use? Do we condone uh, kind of drug market illicit drug market? So this isn't uh, a justification for you know that that kind of i i heard some of the dis discussion that you were having previously and i found that really fascinating but and your speaker talked about the kind of victimology that surrounds uh the, the gender debate well i think there's a similar victimology that surrounds the or very much surrounds the drug issue both in terms of people who consume drugs but also people who were uh incorporated into dealing and and, and trafficking drugs for for economic uh, uh, reasons. And I think one of the things that we were trying to do was puncture that victimology to say that there is an alternative, that, that there is a problem with, with the victim, victim narrative in the sense that it undermines 
what we found, and kind of this is also true of other of, of other research, but very much in terms of our research, is that the victim model didn't fit the individuals that were, uh, you know, kind of involved in, and they 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 kind of rejected that notion of themselves because it didn't fit with the, the way that they saw themselves, and certainly, um, if you kind of look at the way, certainly way, the way that drugs is talked about, um, illicit drug uh, use and illicit drug markets are talked about in the kind of popular sense, and particularly Hollywood and things like that. Kind of, it's usually women and children that are victimized most. They're forced into dealing. They're forced into carrying drugs and things like that. But very much in the case studies that we, we looked at, there were some very strong women who played prominent roles in very local localized drug networks and they were far from victims so we were also trying to puncture that the dominance of the of the victim narrative within the drug stories to, because i think there's a danger with the victim nar narrative in that it undermines the individual's responsibility for acting and taking responsibility for their actions uh, and you can really see that and this is something we try and uncover and unpick in the book is the way in which the victim narrative becomes a way of undermining more traditional notions of uh, responsibility, accountability, rights, uh, particularly within kind of, uh, I suppose, what, what we might loosely call a kind of liberal criminal justice system, which I think personally are, are very, very uh, important. So we were also trying to puncture or offer an alternative that um, this kind of victimology, the way in which the narrative about drugs is generally talked about, it doesn't fit. So it didn't fit our case studies, but also has slightly worrying consequences in terms of holding people account for illegal behavior, basically. You know, uh, you know um, so we, we very much wanted to try and take issue with that that kind of dominant narrative particularly uh in scotland it's a very dominant narrative um uh, around the drug issues that kind of uh, addiction is not necessarily the addict's fault mm, kind of is it's the addict putting the drugs in their body so they have to be held account for that not to hold them account for it is is very very dangerous because if you can't hold yourself account for your own behavior you're going to be stuck in that loop forever and you know that that's a very worrying consequence particularly when we're talking about uh behavior that that is very very dangerous not only to the individual but um others around them as well that's that's a really good answer and it's just brought to mind something actually and i'm not quite sure i don't i don't think we're really allowed to specifically name drugs at, at this point in a, in a conversation on youtube i think just referring to them by their color might be useful so i mean people i suppose in in scotland um you know the brown substance that can be injected is is quite popular for instance and there have been a, you know various initiatives i don't know if these still exist where addicts can go and get clean needles because obviously the risk of certain diseases you know life-threatening diseases one can catch from from sharing needles seems like a bigger problem than many to the actual drug use and i just wondering what what do you feel about that as a potential solution is this something that kind of perpetuates the habit or is it actually alleviating a, a real larger problem i think the case in, in that you're that you're kind of drawing attention to and particularly in scotland is really really interesting but at the same time quite frightening because you mentioned the brown substance the drug that kills most scottish addicts is the substance that they they use to substitute for the brown substance i'm not sure right. a, a particular opioid so more people die of a particular opioid begin with m uh, 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 and which is prescribed to them. That's a, I think you can uh, say that because it's a legal uh, drug. Right, I think methadone. Okay. Me methadone yes. kills the vast majority of, of drug addicts in, in Scotland. And although that it's it's very difficult, nigh impossible to get an accurate uh, assessment of 
what is the legal methadone and what is illegal methadone. But methadone is the drug that is sanctioned by the state uh, to give to addicts to to get them off uh, their other stuff. But it's the the, the drug that, that that they're dying from. Methadone is the drug that they're dying from. I have kind of personally, I have no objections to allowing somebody or providing the facilities for somebody with a, a very serious life-threatening addiction to enable them to take their drug safely. Hmm. However, with the proviso that the, the reason that you're doing that is to get them off the drug, to stop them taking the drug. So I think there is a process where these techniques can be used, but they have to be placed within uh, a properly sanctioned, properly funded, properly legislated for uh, system of, of uh, recovery. You know, kind of, I don't want an addict to be remain an addict. I don't want people to die from uh, overdoses. However, we have in Scotland, and it's similarly in the UK more generally, uh, and Europe more generally, I think, uh, a kind of fetishization or kind of an ideology built around harm reduction that all that we can do for addicts is just to manage their addiction so they're essentially locked into a cycle where they're an addict isn't allowed to be anything else you know so the kind of so the harm reduction narrative is that Recovery programs are uh, problematic because they don't work. Uh, they set too high an expectation on, on the addict to overcome or to attempt to overcome their addiction. So what we need to do is just manage their addiction, provide safe spaces, provide the technology and the paraphernalia through which they can then uh, safely take uh, the, the the drug. I don't think there's anything. There's no such thing as safe drug taking. You will eventually die from it, and that's what's happening. What we don't have um, are properly sanctioned, properly funded, or properly legislated for uh, programs dedicated to allowing the addict to recover from their addiction. Uh, we were too bought in, or the Certainly the powers that be in Scotland and more broadly have bought into this kind of mantra about um, the, the low expectation, basically, that all we can do is just manage the addict's addiction. So we substitute one uh, drug that they're addicted to for another drug, which subsequently they become addicted to and die from. So we have this fairly vicious circle that, that's taking place, um, uh, particularly in Scotland, where addicts are dying from taking the drug that is given to, given to them by the state in order to get them off the other dr drug that they were dying from. So we have this rather r ridiculous kind of almost Kafkan, Kafkian kind of situation. Um, and it, it, it's, it's tragic, really. It, it's, it's... Yeah. No, that, that's a really good answer. You, you just made me think of something there. We might be opening a can of worms here with the time we've got left, but you're saying these kind of no real, I think you said the word safe drug use, and I think that's that's a fair point. And I'm not sure, I know under Gordon Brown, I think he kind of, uh, we I know in, the, in England, I'm not sure if this applies to Scotland as well, uh, that we have the kind of class system to rate drugs, and I think they kind of pertain to how much trouble you're getting caught in possession or dealing. And I think we had, you know, the green one that's most typically smoked was a class C drug for the longest time, got bumped up to a class B under Gordon Brown. I think it's been a while since I've thought about this. And um, the, But this is the, the substance that is kind of glamorized quite a lot. Obviously, it's legal in places like Holland, you know, various states in America now. You, you can get it. It's part of our pop culture. It seems like the police would almost turn a blind eye to it nine times out of ten, mm -hmm. depending on what you're doing with it. Uh, is there an argument here for the legalization of that particular drug or, or actually getting on to your previous point people will promote this particular drug as something you can't get addicted to and it's practically harmless how would you say that kind of narrative stacks up against what you've researched i think um 
uh, you're talking well you uh, um you're talking about kind of drugs that are normally associated with kind of casual drug taking uh, yeah habitual drug use yeah, 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 that that kind of thing i i think i'm not sure you're going to like my answer because i'm going to sit on the fence a bit <laughs> i'm kind of not i don't necessarily i'm not necessarily for the legalization of drugs and I'm not necessarily for the prohibition of them. The kind of, I think where I'm at is people need to be held to account for taking them. If you're going to take them, take them. Uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, however, you have to pay the consequences for take. So if it isn't a legal drug, you have to, you know, face the sanction of, of, of the laws of, of, of the land. Yeah, with great comes... powder comes great responsibility. Yeah, I think. yes. I think absolutely. With great powder <laughs> comes great responsibility. <laughs> absolutely. I think that. So uh, I, I'm neither a kind of advocate. I'm not an advocate of liberal of liberalisation in the sense of getting getting away with the laws. Because I think the point that you make it is very apposite. Because actually, very rarely are the laws laws actually acted on. You know, the, the very generally, the, you know, they're not the police don't enforce them. Uh, it's uh, you know they kind of turn a blind eye. So there is, I think there's a there's a wider question. I'm kind of avoiding your question really and not giving you a straight answer. There's a wider question here, which I think is kind of perhaps more important in the sense of whether we should legislate or liberalize, etc. Uh, and that's the kind of moral question about actually is putting drugs in your body good for society is the fact that you actually get getting wasted every weekend or the fact that you can't talk straight go to work hold down a job is that really a good thing is that really what we should expect a proper society to and a proper an adult society a properly responsible adult society uh, to, to to be about, I think there's a kind of moral question here around which we've lost sight of. I think, which is around what type of society do we want to live in? Is it a society that says, "Oh yeah, you can take this, you can take that," and you're not really responsible for it because you're poor or you had a hard life or you're kind of you know you've been a victim of this and that or you're or or do we really or do we want to say, look? You know, we value your contribution as uh, as a responsible adult, um, and I think that that's a that's a side of the discussion around the drugs issue, whether whether it's just for fun or whether it it is actually a, a, a real problem um, that, that 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 seems to be missing or, or avoided. I think no, uh, policymakers, politicians, experts. Like me, we, although I'm hopefully uh, an exception, we don't like talking about morality because it smacks of kind of old fashioned, fuddy duddy Christian, which I'm not, uh, kind of values that oh, we can't be having that anymore. But I think there is there is a moral component missing from the discussion around drugs and particularly illicit drug taking. That's really interesting because, like you say, the narrative has become very skewed towards the kind of victim mentality, hasn't it? You know, you know, no other options, getting caught up in something, something happening to you rather than you making something happen, I suppose. And, and really, I mean, realistically, the only way people are going to get out of this is, a, is personal responsibility or at least taking help when it's offered, which is a decision they have to make for sure. I mean, maybe in the minute we've got left, perhaps you can tell us a few ways in which, you know, the county lines have adapted over the years to kind of evade new tactics for drug enforcement and things like that has there been any like significant changes that you've seen well i think kind of uh it's actually the other way around it's the law that has utilized county lines to evade taking responsibility for prosecuting <laughs> people right um so like you're talking about the the, the kind of the, the victim victimology or the the, the narratives around victimhood they've been sucked into the the policing regimes uh, and so the big narrative is around vulnerability that the people involved in 
county lines activity drought networks are vulnerable so they can't be treated as inverted commas criminal so if you look at all the kind of recent police briefings certainly since in the last 10 years or so they've kind of rejected you don't you know, they don't talk about drug pushers anymore drug dealers they talk about vulnerable populations uh, uh, particularly young vulnerable people so i think it's not so much that county lines have found ways to evade the law it's actually the law has found ways to evade the law in terms of kind of you know rights and like the classic liberal model of the law is you're guilty or you're you're not guilty but however i think kind of there is now a situation where the law doesn't actually operate like that anymore in the sense that it smudged it's blurred the lines between guilt uh, uh, and innocence you know kind of you're vulnerable yeah Carlton, so you're kind of neither guilty or innocent you're you're just kind of in this kind of legal limbo of vulnerability so yeah, you're not think, one thing or the other i think this is my fault I, I poked at the morality issue a bit with a minute to go carlton but that was a very a very good point which is fascinating to me for sure the the kind of the the, the reluctance of law to wax on this now but uh, maybe you could let people know the just the title of your book again and where people can find it please yeah it's uh, the book is um contesting County Lines, uh, Case Studies in Drug Crime and Deviant Entrepreneurship. It's not an academic book. It is, but it's kind of written in a very kind of open, accessible way. And it's published by Bristol University Press. Carlton, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on and speaking to us. I Thank really you very appreciate much. it. Thank you for having me. That's been great. Thank you. Take care. And you. All right, ladies and gents, and uh, those who don't care for my antiquated gender labels, uh, if you would like to get yourself over to Locals now to watch the next half of the show, it's completely free. We don't want anything. Just, just go over, get your eyeballs on it. I'm just going to wait here while you do that again. All right, we're going to bring in our next guest. Nicholas, welcome to Outward Unleashed. How are you? Hi, Steve. I'm fine. Thank you. Excellent. So, uh, lots to talk about. And it's, a, it's a fascinating period in time that, uh, you know, it's just kind of, it's never really fell out of people's interest, really, has it? This this topic for, for, for many reasons, which we'll get into. So maybe you can just uh, explain to people what it is you do, what keeps you busy. Sure. So um, I'm the uh, Associate Professor at Nottingham Trent University, and I specialise in the history of the Crusades and the Mongol invasions. So I've written a book recently called The Mongol Storm, and it's looking at the Mongol invasions into the Middle East, but doing so from a global perspective, the entire planet, or certainly Eurasia and um, parts of North Africa, are in the process in the 13th century of being overthrown by this tidal wave of invasions from Mongol armies until their empire stretches from the Pacific coast to the borders of Hungary and Poland or down to the borders of um, Syria in the southwest and it's looking at that it's looking at this process of conquest and how this um, this 